Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss the importance of women's foundations and their dedication to improving the lives of women with special guests. Felicia Davis, President and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women. Mary Rutherford, President and CEO of the Montana Community Foundation. And Elizabeth Barajas Roman, President and CEO of the Women's Funding Network. So thank you all for joining. It's good. It, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, women comprise over 50% of Americans, so women are not a minority numerically. But let's talk frankly about why it's so important to have foundations that are dedicated to philanthropic causes that advance the interest, interests of women. Felicia, could you start us off on your views uh, and the views of your donors and grantees across greater Chicago? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Mark. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel with Elizabeth and Mary. Um, and Chicago, well, generally, Chicago Foundation for Women was founded in 1985. And at that time, there was a um, paltry amount of money in organized philanthropy being dedicated specifically to women and girls. And that hasn't changed in 35 plus years. Today, about 1.7% of all the money that is um, given in organized philanthropy is specifically dedicated to women and girls. And it looks different when we start to look at the intersectional identities that women and girls have. So black women and girls, for example, Latina women and girls, indigenous women and girls, the numbers continue to go down from there. So it hasn't really been a priority, um, but now, um, I think over 35 years with the, the work that's been done by not just um, women's foundations, um, the Women's Funding Network and others, there's a, an awakening and an acknowledgement. And in this moment, this big moment that we have with COVID, there was a huge opportunity and opening for everyone to really understand how seminal um, women and girls are to our society and truly how similar they are to the work that nonprofits do every day. And so the work that's being done in our communities every single day. I think it's also important to, to consider how society, power and wealth are tilted. They're tilted in particular ways. We, we of course have become far more aware of the tilt uh, based in race, right? Um, but there's also been a tilt based in gender. Uh, if you look historically, women couldn't own property for, for the longest time. And the philanthropists were men, and the, and the people who were on boards were men, and the people who were making the decisions were men. Yet, um, you take a look at this sort of 50% uh, uh, of the population that are women, and it just is insane that we are not engaging women, right, Mary? I mean, in terms of, of, of how we function as a society, we should be taking 100% advantage of every person that we have in America. Absolutely. You know, and at the Montana Community Foundation, well, Mark, I do want to say thanks for inviting us to this panel. And it's great to, to be with this incredible group of women. Um, it, it is crazy that that women really haven't been um, as represented in in the boardroom, in the legislature, um, even in the um, upper and middle management of many organizations. And so uh, part of the work that we've done over the years is really working, frankly, with some of the, the women who are graduating from college to help them understand like how they can advocate for themselves, both from salary negotiations to getting onto boards to being involved, and also reminding the men that these are your daughters, these are your granddaughters, these are your sisters, and no good idea comes from one single person. And your bottom line is going to be so much better when you're a far more inclusive organization. So those are some of the things that we've worked on. Also, assumptions get challenged, right? When you, when you become more inclusive, assumptions get challenged. When assumptions are challenged, you get better decisions. Elizabeth, you have a very interesting uh, role here because you are basically a network of funders. So um, how do you, how does your network, and you've been around for, for uh, quite a while, um, how does your network see this issue? And in particular, how do you address a systemic change, not just um, points of philanthropy, but using philanthropy to actually shift this imbalance so that a woman's funding network becomes less critical because it's the imbalance has been addressed. Hmm. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for, for having us here today. Uh, 
And that's a that's a really great question. Uh, you know, so the Women's Funding Network is the largest uh, alliance of women's funds and gender justice funders in the world. So we're a global network of of organizations that focus on uh, women and girls and gender justice and gender uh, gender equality. Um, and why that's important is that each of uh, what's important to remember about women's funds and uh, many gender justice funders around the world is that they're hyper local. They they work within their communities. They work within their uh, states. Uh, to address the immediate and long-term needs of women and girls, but but also specifically uh, how gender plays a role in the economic recovery, in the uh, economic security and safety of of all families. Uh, so you know, with those with that very hyper local role, it makes them really effective, it makes them really quick, but it also can be kind of isolating. So one of the things that Women's Funding Network does is really combine the power of all that local knowledge uh, into a global network so that uh, ideas are kind of cross-pollinated so that uh, we can move together on policy in certain areas. Like in the U.S., we have our largest, uh, our largest number of members are in the U.S. So women's funds um, here in the U.S. are working together to shape policy on gender here in the United States. Um, and that looks like, and why that's important because uh, women's funds at the local level can talk about what's working. They're not just kind of picking policy out of the air. They're saying, you know, this worked in Arizona, this worked in Chicago, this worked in, uh, you know, Montana. And when when they're able to bring that up to the federal level and to Congress, it means something. It's not again, it means something about what the what the, the appetite is uh, for uh, certain types of policy change. Um, and it means that there's a built-in network to support that policy change at that federal level. So, you know, again, the organizing of, of what women's fund and gender justice funders do, yes, they move money. Yes, it's about philanthropy, but it's also, number one, it's about advocacy. What you heard Felicia say and Mary say is that there wasn't a place in the kind of, kind of traditional philanthropy for women's voices um, and women's voices to center the things that are most important for them. Um, and that's where women's funds really came together um, and, and started in their local communities. Uh, and so that's why you know, uh, the Women's Funding Network brings that together. But it, again, it's really just also lifting up the importance of those voices um, and the local solutions that they, that they fund and also advocate for. I'd like to hear your, your thoughts, the thoughts of, of everyone on this, this, uh, this conference on the, the juxtaposition between uh, traditional values, traditional roles, um, that every community has, and it doesn't matter if it's um, if it's internationally defined or ethnically defined or religiously defined, right? There are uh, traditional roles that split along gender uh, lines, and there is sometimes a feeling of uh, of threat of of changing those roles. Uh, we've seen this uh, unfold through history in the United States and elsewhere in the struggles that uh, women and girls face. Um, very often with this idea of suppressing educational opportunity or work opportunity or, or equal salary or whatever. Uh, Felicia, how do you see that uh, unfolding and how can your philanthropy create a greater understanding so that there isn't this oppositional uh, nature to, um, to the advances that, that women need to uh, undertake and there's more support on both sides of the gender divide? You know, Mark, that's a really great question. I mean, as we do this work of, of um, really challenging these assumptions, the, stat, the status quo, as we do the work of challenging what um, gender norms mean and that women stay home and cook and clean, men go to work, little boys play with, you know, fire trucks and little girls play with dolls and girls wear pink. And, you know, all of these things are, are, are false constructs. Um, but that means, but what happened, but how that got translated is then in educational pursuits, women were, um, you know, dumbed down, their aspirations were tampered down, and they weren't allowed to really express the fullness of their- Women can't do math, right? Right, right. Can't <laughs> do math, or, you know, you're an artist, or those things. And so because of that, then the world of work mimics that, which then limits the opportunities that women have. Um, but also to, I mean, to a lesser extent, limits the opportunities that, you know, men would have, right? Because right. if we really play to individual strengths 
and individual capabilities, this world looks a lot different because you talked about this earlier, right? Women are over, women are about 51% of the population. So you're telling me that women don't have, aren't as equally talented to be the scientists and doctors, uh, bankers and lawyers, and that the C-suite- Inventors, engineers, military leaders, government leaders. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, and so for us, and I think the, you know, Mary and Elizabeth share this as well. Part of what we do, the advocacy piece is so incredibly important to lift up those stories and use our dollars. You know, I always say I'm an underdog and I am, I'm pushing the status quo for other underdogs. Like people count you out. I'm intersectional. I have an intersectional identity of woman and a black and black being black. And so I, the dollars that we activate are to help every other girl in this city see herself in any suite that she wants to be in, that she can see herself at the seat of power, that a little girl like me from the South side of Chicago could see the little girl like me from the South side of Chicago could be the first lady of the United States, could be president of the United States, right? That uh, Kamala, that our vice president with her intersectional identity. And also I'm gonna touch on ageism a little bit that at 54, arguably is at the highest level of her power. And at 54, most of us are being pushed out of, you know, out of the workforce. Well, obviously Dame Judy Dench can't act, right? Cause she's too old, right? Uh, Mary, you're, you're you're still on you're still on mute, but I'm I'm going to ask you. So you know, if you look at Felicia's point, right, and you look at our great um, diverse America of of rural areas and urban areas and black and white and native and and diverse Asian, diverse Latino uh, ethnicities and all these other um, groups, right? It's it's pretty obvious that. Felicia's experience in Chicago is very similar to someone's experience in rural Montana, right? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that Montana, um, we don't have an extremely diverse um, ethnic population. Uh, about 7% of our population are indigenous people and 92% are white. Um, but what we see is this stark disparity um, between those ethnicities. And, you know, Montana has this uh, unfortunate reality of missing and murdered indigenous women. And that's something that we have really uh, started to get more involved in and started funding, frankly, family searches, because there are all these questions about who has um, authority, uh, you know, whose jurisdiction is, uh, involved if an indigenous person who lives on a, um, uh, a, a tribal land is found, uh, comes missing in a city that is not tribal land. And, and so the disparities are stark. Uh, women are already at an extreme uh, economic disadvantage in Montana compared to men, um, but it's even more uh, uh, just horrible for our indigenous sisters. And, you know, it was it's a little disheartening, frankly, one of the battles that, or I don't know if it's a battle, but one of the things that we're um, involved in uh, to a smaller degree probably than some of the panelists is, is um, legislative activity. And when I was watching our legislature this year, our legislature meets every other year, um, we were working to advance an early childhood initiative. Um, and one of our legislators on the floor stood up and said, well, I don't think women should be working. They should be staying home. They should be taking care of the house. They should be having babies. And frankly, at this day and age, 2021 was frankly pretty appalling to hear. And so we have a long road ahead of us in Montana. Uh, Mary, doesn't that, mirror, doesn't that mirror the uproar over the president talking about care as infrastructure? And you know, <sighs> let's be honest, this entire country came to a standstill because we could not provide care. When women had to leave the workforce, 5 million women are out of the workforce yes. right now because of the pandemic. Many of them, the sole thing that is keeping them out of that workforce is ample care. The provision Absolutely. of being able to have child care. So we're making choices. And it's, 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 and so I, I wanted to make that point that even the issues in Montana aren't that very different. We have a, 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 a crisis of missing and murdered black women and trans women in Chicago that we've had to do special grant making on. And so the, the, the invisibility of women, I think is something that is consistent no matter where we are geography. I think Elizabeth sees that too with the WFN and the work across the country and globally. 
You know, we just completed a uh, a poll, Elizabeth, in which we asked whether there whether there is this imbalance. One hundred percent of respondents said yes, there is there is an imbalance. So let's talk a little bit about how we um, we address that because if um, a, a state with ninety two uh, percent um, uh, uh, a white ethnic group, so uh, European origin, seven percent native. Uh, which looks completely different from a Chicago, which is an incredible melting pot, very diverse, and completely different from, from different uh, areas of the United States, has the exact same problem. So we know this is not an ephemeral issue. We know this is a persistent one. And you all were nodding about the whole idea of infrastructure, including childcare. I just think that's that's really interesting. If you, if you include uh, women's voices um, in this debate, um, what kind of changes do you believe are required going forward in this country that will have the greatest impact on on uh, on evening up the score so that when we ask the question again, are women treated equally to men instead of having 100 percent say no, that we, we have a, a much more even balance? Elizabeth, if you were to go in to pick one or two things that we should change in our society to even up that balance, what would you pick? <clears throat> well, I think that one of the key uh, pieces here is really how we think about women's work, women in work and women's work. So it's not just that uh, women are not working uh, or whether or not they should work, but thinking about what it means to have women's work, whether it's unpaid work, uh, looking after children and taking care of a home, or it's women's work like being teachers and caregivers and uh, child care workers. Uh, you know, that's one of the things why it was so, uh, you know, why that big uproar, right? You know, how is it infrastructure? Uh, because it, there's something about the narrative around what is considered women's work um, that is undervalued is quite frankly undervalued. And because uh, society thinks of women should, should still largely thinks that women should be at home taking care of children, um, that the idea of, of childcare is a privilege, that it's something that if you are able to afford it, or if you're able to do that, it's a privilege and not something that's part of a core public good for our economy. Um, you know, one thing that sticks in my head is, is around, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't very long ago, I mean, in the 70s, when women weren't allowed to open um, bank accounts on their own. I mean, that's, it's, so when we think about why this is still persisting in 2021, it's not just about the, atti the attitudes follow the policy. You know, we have policies that were in place, you know, you know not too long ago. Um, just the simple act of owning a bank account with your name on it to have access to the money and, that, and, and the, where that money goes. Um, was just recent, was a recent um, uh, uh, innovation. Um, so the idea that we have a long way to go, we just got started. We've just gotten started. And so the idea around uh, childcare as the infrastructure and what needs to change, I think there's the attitudes, the piece around what does it take, what does it, what does it look like to value women at work and women's work? Because the idea that women could be anything, we've been hearing that, which is great. I want women to be engineers and astronauts. But I also want them to feel just as valued in the society and in, as, as um, important and essential and in terms of the good, a good job if they were a teacher or a care worker uh, as if they were a uh, construction worker. You know, those jobs should be equally, uh, um, equally uh, um, compensated uh, because they're just as essential. That road that goes to the city is just as essential as having care workers and teachers uh, in a city. So those should be equal good paying jobs. And until those two things are the same, um, you know, we, we, we have work to do. So- Mark, uh, Mark, I would just, if you, if I might just jump in and say, absolutely, Elizabeth. And I think the only way that we're going to get there is when uh, the people who are making the decisions are equally represented by both men and women sitting around that table. Because unless their voices are heard and expressed, we're not, it, that's what's going to be required to see those kinds of changes. You know, the old adage, you know, if, if you're not, um, uh, you know, if you're not around the table, you know, you're on the menu. And that's the, that's the reality, like getting that voice equally heard. It's really voting more women into office, you mean? 
um, all, all tables, you know, I think all decision making tables, whether that's um, uh, policymakers at the elected level, whether that's corporate executives, whether that's, you know, school boards or any other kinds of entity where decisions are made um, or things are discussed, women need to be equally represented. I have a Mark, can I add, the other thing that I would add is the economic impact of this. So there are estimates that it's costing us $65 billion a year in economic activity because women, these because of COVID related job losses, that's 65 billion. So if you wanna argue about the investments in care infrastructure, think about what the ROI is on, on all of us by having that economic activity and productivity return to the workforce. Um, the other thing that I would say, you know, we need sick leave for all persons, all working persons. Um, we've already talked a lot about care, but I will say again, we need affordable, accessible child care and inf the infrastructure of child care has to be supported. And I think um, Elizabeth touched on the pay parity as well. We need gender pay parity for same work. In our region here, the, the, if Chicago were world class and paying women equitably, and this was from um, the reports by leanin.org, it would be over um, $58 billion in GDP into our local economy here. So the other thing is that people think, oh, this is like all soft touch feely type of stuff. There's a real economic price for all of these things and for this inequity. Well, it's interesting. You're, you're making a, a judgment, uh, a, 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 a justice, as well as a, a economic argument. Um, one of the things that I think is, is so very fascinating about, about this discussion is um, the practicality of creating action. If you take a look at the uh, discussion right now surrounding infrastructure, when you're talking about building ro roads, there are real interest groups who are going to get that money. There are construction firms, there are logistics um, uh, organizations, there are businesses that are moving their trucks across the country. There are, uh, when we're talking about internet infrastructure, there are technology firms, they're going to get the money. When you're talking about childcare, there is no such economic interest of a scale to lobby for it. So when you, when you look at the practicalities of getting legislation passed that includes childcare as infrastructure, which is a point that you've all made, um, that it is an essential part of infrastructure from your perspective, it's kind of difficult. How do you change that? How do you make that argument when there's no business lobby behind that kind of investment. Indeed, the business lobby would see it in their interest to, instead of investing that money in dispersed childcare that could go to anyone, uh, to instead uh, have that money go into more roads, more physical infrastructure that could go to them. How do you, how do you deal with that um, in, 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 in raw tactical terms, Felicia? Well, I, I, I have to hold myself back from laughing. So, because let's for a minute, a minute, just assume we all think that having children being born into the United States is a good thing for the country, right? Like this to grow our population, to have people. Um, but yet we're saying, but somebody else needs to take care of those kids and women, it should be you. This, this is, so to me, the lobby the lobby is all of us. The lobby is corporations. I mean, let's not let's let's forget. Let's not forget that in childcare centers across this country, the commodities from the United States Department of Agriculture are like the number one way that many of these children and these childcare centers across it. That has I don't know what that dollar value is. It's significant, I am sure, in milk and bread and fruit and all the things that children are eating when they're in school. Well, isn't that part of that lobby? And if I have a multinational company and I need a capable, talented, skilled workforce that is inclusive of the most diverse voices, well, would not be part of that lobby. And if I am government, um, would not be part of that lobby. So, and, and of course, you know, it should not just fall to the shoulders of women to be that lobby. So I, I laugh at that uh, assertion a little bit because, I mean, honestly, think about it. It's a, it's a little... I know this is the way it's been done, and I know that's the way people have felt for a long time, but we should laugh at ourselves for, for being so. Look at other countries. Other countries have figured this out, and there was a, an, an economist who said, you know, in other countries, when this pandemic hit globally, other countries had real infrastructure. United States had women. 
You know, it's it, it's so it's so interesting. What you're saying is is that uh, the statement um, surrounding the um, the interests here that um, businesses um, the business lobby is interested in investments that flow to them. It's actually what you're saying is the if, is if that's the analysis, it's a flawed analysis. Basically, you're saying if you invest in childcare then the actual advantage disperses throughout the economy. Elizabeth, do your members see it that way as well in your network? Absolutely, absolutely. That is that is absolutely part of, of the equation. Um, the Women's Money Network actually has a, a pilot project going on right now. It's a Women's Economic Mobility Project. And it's in nine different states, uh, nine different locations. And these, uh, these locations are piloting different um, aspects and different tactics to be able to increase the not only the economic security, but economic mobility and prosperity of, of women and their families. And when you look at some of the projects that they're doing, including uh, you know, Felicia in, in Chicago is doing, uh, is one of the part of that, that uh, community as well. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach. They're not just looking at um, jobs. They're not just looking at school. They're looking at childcare, school, j good jobs. They're looking at all of those things um, because it really does take uh, all of that in order to increase the uh, mobility of, of women and their families. And why, why even focus on that? Because it's, again, looking just at the raw data, we know from all around the world that the best investment in a society in terms of its economic mobility and security uh, and, and the ability of that community to thrive is when you invest in women and you invest in the, the women, um, that it absolutely trickles down to um, uh, increase the, the, the livelihood and stability of an entire community. So they figure that out when the US does uh, international development, that's how they put their money. They put their money in women and families. Why is, not, why is the United States not doing uh, what they would do in other countries here? You know, and, and I'm just in knowing that that's exactly where the investment should lie. Um, yeah, so it's, it's absolutely what our, our network is doing and focusing on multi-pronged approach, um, thinking about, uh, you know, all of the different aspects that women contribute to this. And I'll just go back to childcare, just as a quick example, People think about childcare as a women's issue, but what's ironic is that what we've seen uh, during this pandemic when tables are formed uh, to, to address the childcare issue, to talk about dollars that are coming into their community and how they should address it, our network is describing tables that are mostly male. These are mostly male tables that are talking about the infrastructure dollars that are coming into the community to partially address childcare and oftentimes our members are the only women at the table talking about gender and talking about the gendered role of childcare, which is insane, right? You would think that absolutely you would bring uh, women to the table, but it's just not happening, even in a childcare issue. So just to, just, just to think about, you know, why it's so important to have uh, women's funds at the table in particular, because they do bring that advocacy and that philanthropy, but just uh, advocates at the table that are going to center gender. And it's not just about talking about the women's issue, it's about centering gender and its critical role that it plays um, in addressing these issues. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely on, on board with that. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. We're gonna give Mary the last word, but to set you up, Mary, on, on uh, one of our polls, we, we asked, uh, has gender equality advanced since 2010? And the, the consensus answer seems to be uh, yes, uh, unevenly, but unevenly and not enough. And then we, we set the next question up with that one, which was what, is, what will have the biggest long-term productive impact on advancing the interests of women? And um, it was interesting. We got, we got a whole range of different answers. The biggest answer was with 65% was education that integrates gender equality teachings. And then also, um, uh, uh, it, it, it was basically getting civil society groups, uh, religious, civil society, business, and other groups behind gender equality. You know, those seem to be the, the biggest, um, the biggest uh, change drivers. Uh, Mary, what, what is your admonition to us all, men and women, people across different races, communities, uh, regions, across rural and urban uh, communities? What is your admonition to us all in terms of trying to change this situation so that the country becomes stronger. Uh, wow, way to way to throw me a really tough one there at the end. Um, I would say, you know, we're all in this together, 
And uh, if, if I'm a man or if I'm a woman, uh, I care about my community. I care about the future of my community. I care about my neighbor. Uh, we like to say in Montana, you know, it's one big state uh, with just one road and a few stoplights. Uh, you have a million people. We're the fourth largest state. And we like to say that neighbor is a verb here. And we work really hard to try to be good neighbors. And being a good neighbor means standing at the fence uh, and, and listening to each other and listening deeply and trying to walk in someone else's shoes to at least understand maybe what, what other people are dealing with. And my admonition for all of us is to be better listeners and open up to possibilities and think about what could be. Because if we can think about what could be, I'm sure we can all figure out a way to make it happen. So just as true in Chicago, right, Felicia? Absolutely. Uh, Mary, very well put. Thank you so much. And Elizabeth, across the United States and the world, just as true for, for us all, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you, Mary. That's great. Felicia Davis, President and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women. Mary Rutherford, President and CEO of the Montana Community Foundation. Elizabeth Barajas uh, uh President and CEO of the Women's Funding Network. Thank you so much for helping us to understand this really important issue. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for the work of your staff, your constituents, your boards. And, and thank you all attendees for uh, contributing. Uh, for uh, spending time with us. And we'll see you on Tuesday to talk about uh, AIDS in America, another uh, virus that uh, actually where, where the work on COVID promises uh, some uh, advances. So, so thank you all. And thank you all for, for sharing. Really, this has been a fantastic discussion.